and welcome uh, to Cybersecurity in K-12, what to know and how to get started with cyber. My name is Julia Flores, and I will be one of your facilitators for today. I am the co-founder and principal consultant at CS for Success. Allow me to tell you a little bit about us. At CS for Success, we aim to create a more equitable, accessible and inclusive landscape for computer science education. We envision a world in which all students have the opportunity to pursue introductory to advanced level coursework, partake in hands-on skill training, and understand the real world applications of their classroom experiences. To do this, we are focusing on working with districts, schools, as well as teacher and student supporting organizations like IDEA and cyber.org to develop content and programs that provide high quality computer science experiences for youth and adults. Uh, just to tell you a little bit more about myself, I have been in education for almost 20 years and it has spanned from the classroom to district administration and curriculum and instruction. Um, but when I first started, I was actually hired to, to be an accounting, an accounting teacher. But when I got there, uh, they found that they needed an IT teacher. And so that's how I became an IT and computer science teacher. Um, I was able to, to learn as I was going with the students because I did not have an IT or a computer science background. And I keep on saying computer science because cybersecurity is part of... Uh, computer science is, is the one of the, the concepts within computer science. Um, so I had to learn as I was going and I really did have to em embrace the, I don't know, but let's work together and figure that out. Um, quite often, if not a daily basis, multiple times a day. Um, so I'm here to tell you that it is possible to teach computer science, cybersecurity, um, IT without being an expert. And today, unlike uh, back then, there are so many more amazing resources that are available, professional development that is available from organizations like IDEA and cyber.org that really help you make sure that that journey is, is a smooth and uh, joyful one. So before I jump into our content though, uh, I want to turn it over to uh, Dr. Chuck Gardner from cyber.org. He will uh, introduce himself, but he is also going to be presenting today. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Julia. I'm glad to be with you. It's my pleasure to, to join everyone on the call today. I see some familiar faces in the audience. Thanks for joining. Um, my name is Dr. Chuck Gardner. I'm the Senior Director for Government and Nonprofit Engagement at cyber.org. Uh, I've been uh, working with the, the team at cyber.org, formerly NYSERC, since around 2015. I've been in education since 2006. I started teaching middle school in Florida, uh, math and, and uh, algebra and geometry courses, did a little bit of yearbook. Um, I was a career changer coming out of the maritime field into education. Uh, and then around 2011, I moved to New Orleans, started teaching high school, high school algebra. Uh, and that's when I started teaching robotics and uh, got introduced to, to this team and then started writing some curriculum and had the opportunity to get out of the classroom and, and move up to Northwest Louisiana, lovely Bossier Shreveport area. Uh, if you're familiar with any of the routes between Atlanta and Dallas, we're right on I-20, about three hours outside of Dallas. But i um, been working with this team as a curriculum development specialist, director of curriculum, associate director, and now uh, senior director, and uh, just love to be able to bring the message uh, about the program to teachers across the country to schools and school districts to support professional development, uh, as well as the curriculum development mess, um, mission uh, that we have. So we are funded through a grant from Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA. Uh, they've been the primary funding uh, engine for cyber.org's work since 2012. And with that opportunity, we've had the, um, you know, the ability now to provide outreach to over 27,000 teachers across the country, all 50 states. I'm getting into my presentation, so I'll stop. But um, uh, thanks. Uh, it's, it's again, my pleasure to be here. <laughs> New Orleans has got to be my favorite place. That was a great world. time. I go at least once a year. <laughs> yeah, I was there for five years and loved every minute. Nice. All right, so let's jump in. So today we are going to demystify what cybersecurity is. 
as well as explaining how you can bring cybersecurity to your students. We'll also hear more um, from Dr. Gardner about cyber.org's uh, K-12 cybersecurity education uh, platform. Then we will help you find resources to support you and your students. And then we'll wrap up and identify some uh, next steps. And this will take us through our hour together. So what is cybersecurity? Cybersecurity is a growing field and rightfully so. So let's start shedding some light on this subject. I like to believe that starting with understanding devices is the beginning, right? So all three of the images on the left are of computing devices, also known as computers. But what makes them computers? Well, all three have a way to capture data, whether that's through their cameras, through the keyboards, uh, the microphone, or some other plug-in accessory. They also have parts that allow them to store, process, and retrieve data. And they also have a way to give that data back to you, whether that's through the screen or through the speakers or through a printout. Over time, these computers have evolved from single uh, function devices like the calculator uh, to the more multi function devices like a laptop, which can help you in creating documents, as well as listening to music, watching uh, movies, paying your bills online. Um, and, the, and the watch uh, not only tells time, but it try, keeps track of the steps that you're taking. It can monitor your heart rate. Um, it can even allow you to make phone calls. So technology is becoming more and more convenient and harder and harder to avoid. And that is because computers are everywhere. Uh, we use them at work, we use them at school, while we're on the road um, through the computers on the car, not because we're on our devices while we're driving, um, and at home. So I, for one, love my home hub, which is the, the HomePod, Apple's version uh, of a home hub, um, mainly because I love music and I like to be able to, to tell uh, Siri hopefully it's not listening and play something, to play some sort of music. Uh, but I can also ask it anything I want. I have one in the kitchen. So when I need to do conversions, I could just ask, hey, what is this in teaspoons? Um, so it's really convenient for me. Uh, and many people have gaming systems in their homes. And now we're using them more and more at home, more than ever before. And not just because we have the PCs and the gaming systems, like I mentioned, uh, but because many of our household appliances now have computer chips in them to give us more access to them via the internet. So from your, from your phone or from your tablet or even from your watch, you are able to connect to your connected thermostat and set the temperature of your home or adjust the temperature of your home. You can check to see who is ringing the doorbell. You can turn on, off, and adjust the color of your lights. Um, you could check to see who is triggering your uh, motion detector in the alley. There are smart TVs. Your washer it can text you and tell you, hey, we're done with this cycle. Come and, and get, us, get us out of here, um, as well as make a cup of coffee. These types of devices are always patiently watching and waiting for you to give them some sort of a command to tell them to do something. So let us know, do any of you all have any of these uh, connected devices in your homes? Let us know in the chat. <laughs> I'd love to know. So as we previously mentioned, all computers are collecting, processing, storing, and retrieving some sort of data. Uh, and what type of data do these devices have, you ask? Well. I talked about using computers to organize and save data in documents. So think resumes, budgets, presentations. Um, all of these documents can hold very valuable information, such as your entire work history, um, your social security number, uh, how your spending habits, um, presentations that you've made that might have proprietary information for your job. We also use them to save 
uh, vital health information, um, as well as financial documents like your tax returns. Uh, we also use them to store and edit our photos and our videos, all of the precious memories that we're collecting uh, as we're here. You also might have, like I just mentioned, proprietary information, such as the secret set, uh, recipe to your, your organization, your company's secret hot sauce that makes millions of dollars a year. You know, there's so many things that our devices are, are holding. And your devices are also keeping track of your usage data, uh, as well as your location, at least some of these, uh, some of these devices are. And why is this important, right? All of these data points are important to us, um, but that data can also be very valuable to other people. And there are people out there who would love to get their hands on your data for one reason or another, nefarious or just complete uh, trickery. And those that attempt to take your information without you actually authorizing them are called hackers. So let's think our financial data, our financial information can allow somebody to steal money from, from, you, from your bank. Usage information. So if you think about your thermostat, that thermostat is logging when it's turning on, when it's turning off. And with that information, a, a very motivated and highly technical burglar knows when you're home and when you're not home and when best to come into your house. Uh, proprietary information um, can allow somebody to steal valuable ideas. Can you imagine if somebody got their hands on Coke's secret recipe? That is a highly valuable document, um, as well as Memories, our memories are priceless. How much wouldn't you pay if somebody held the only copy of your child's first step for ransom or the only pictures, copies of pictures that you have of your wedding or your parents' wedding or graduation photos, right? And hackers will use the weaknesses in your devices to get at that data. So then what is cybersecurity? That brings us to the heart of the matter. We need to be able to protect our information. And that is what cybersecurity is. Or as stated here, cybersecurity is the collected methods, technologies, and processes that are used to help protect against criminal and unauthorized use of electronic data. So we definitely do not want people to have access. That is what cybersecurity is. So what does this mean in practical terms though? So if you have a device that is not connected to the internet, it's unplugged, as you say, a hacker needs physical access to your device. And once they have it, they would try to access your information by doing things like guessing your password. And that's if the computer is password protected or your, or your phone or they might use a flash drive to download your files, or they could use a flash drive to upload malware, uh, a virus, to change or delete information, right? However, if you are on a plug device or if it's connected to the internet, you also have to worry about virtual attacks. So not just somebody physically getting their hands on your computer, and trying to, to crack your password, but also um, somebody trying to access it from remote. Those attacks can, for example, happen in the form of an email that has malware in an attachment. And once you click that attachment, it downloads and now it's doing something to your system that you did not want to happen. Or there might be a link that'll send you to some bogus website and try to collect your information that way. So who should learn cybersecurity? Well, all individuals that have or are using devices um, and should have some understanding of how to protect the information that they have on those devices. But individuals aren't the only ones. Oops, I get started and I forget to click. Uh, 
businesses also have data that they need to protect, whether that's their financial data or their proprietary data. Um, they all can stand, they all have something to lose. So they need to also be able to protect themselves. But let's also think governments also have a lot of information that people might want to use against them. And so they too have to protect themselves against people who would come in and take their information. So in short, everyone, everyone should have some sort of basic understanding of what cybersecurity is and be able to implement uh, certain practices to protect that data. Um, and even if you think you may not have data that lives online, there is very likely a social security uh, number sitting on some server somewhere else that you're hoping someone else is protecting. We still need to know um, about these things. It's better to be informed. And now that we know what some of these dangers are of having our information existing on these devices um, and the importance of protecting that data, we need to help our youth protect their own data as well as they will be eventually coming, growing and, and graduating into a society where so much information, so much of their information is on uh, the internet or on a device. Um, especially since so many of them already share massive amounts of data on a daily basis through their social media platforms. Yeah. Let's move into figuring out how we can teach youth about cybersecurity. In a quality cybersecurity program, you will not only learn the definition of cybersecurity, but you will also learn and teach your students ways to protect their data. On this educational journey, you'll both learn about the hardware, the software, and protocols that will best protect all of your data. But first, I want to stop and talk about a house bill that makes teaching cybersecurity even more important. And that is House Bill 2170. If you're teaching in Illinois, and I suspect you might be because um, this is an idea uh, webinar, then it's important to mention House Bill 2170. There were many things in this House Bill. Um, there were many mandates that are bottled here, but we went through it and we pulled out the two that pertained to computer science, computer literacy, and com uh, cybersecurity. So this is going to seem like it's coming kind of out of left field, but I promise to pull it together uh, by the last, by the next slide. So the first of the two mandates that I want to talk about is in regards to computer science coursework. This mandate states that beginning in school year 2023, 2024, which is not this one, but the next one, the school board of any school district that maintains any of grades nine through 12 shall provide an opportunity for every high school student to take at least one computer science course aligned to rigorous learning standards of the State Board of Education. Now, one thing that I want to point out here is that this does pertain to high school uh, only. It is for the following year. And it does not say that all the students have to take it. It says that all students have to be offered um, a class. They have to have the opportunity to, to take it, right? And that's an important uh, distinction to make. So you're likely asking yourself, what does this have to do with cybersecurity? Well, in the very beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that cybersecurity education is actually a part of computer science education. So if you're in high school and you satisfy the requirement uh, to teach a cybersecurity course and you have the appropriate endorsement, um, teaching cybersecurity is not just because, you know, this is exactly what students need to learn to navigate the world, the digital world that they live in, but it's also a requirement. So it's uh, two good things. However, if you are not a high school computer science teacher, then the second mandate may be more relevant to you. And in this mandate, it states, all school districts shall ensure that students receive uh, developmentally appropriate opportunities to gain computer literacy skills beginning in elementary school. 
Now, this applies to both elementary school and high school because it says they're beginning in elementary school. The only difference is that in high school, it's required to be a, an intense unit that's embedded in another class, kind of like civics, I, I believe, or home ec um, was way back in the when when I was in school. Um, so it doesn't have to be an entire class, but it does have to be embedded. Um, and implementation for the mandate, for this mandate begins this school year. So it should have already started and it is not optional. So it's not just you have to provide the opportunity for the student. You actually have to embed computer literacy into uh, the school year for all students. So now again, this is probably still a little confusing, um, but I promised I would pull it together. And here we are. There are a few different places that you can go to find more information about the expectations of a cybersecurity education. The first is the Illinois State Board of Education's Computer Literacy Competencies. Now, the image that we have on the right is just one snippet of the competencies that are listed, but this particular set uh, is about data management and security. And that, as we know, is cybersecurity. So there are a set of competencies that educators have to embed in their instruction in some way, um, K through 12. And I cut it off here because I was trying to get it big enough for you all to read, but it does go K through 12. Um, so things like protect accounts by logging out of applications on shared computing devices, right? That's just in case somebody tries to crack your password, using passwords, passphrases to secure individual devices. So all of these um, have to be embedded in your instruction. And this is mandatory for every grade level. So by teaching cybersecurity, you are actually meeting one of two or both mandates that were outlined in House Bill 2170. So that's the good news. The next document that I want to mention is ISBE's Computer Science Standards. Uh, we mentioned in the beginning that cybersecurity is a subset of computer science, and it is so in this document. This, again, is just a snapshot of grades K through 2 standards, but cybersecurity is a subset of the network and the Internet's concept area in every single grade band from K through 12. So there it is again, it's just one more amazing reason to teach cybersecurity. Now, the most comprehensive of the three documents I, am, uh, I have on the screen here are cyber.org's K-12 cybersecurity learning standards because these focus on cybersecurity. Um, they brought in uh, educators as well as industry professionals to put together a very comprehensive K uh, through 12 set of standards. And I won't go into them because I know that Dr. Gardner is going to go and, and talk about them and I don't want to steal your thunder, but know that they exist and that they are an amazing resource, amazing resource for anyone looking to integrate cybersecurity into their instruction. So how do we start? That's a great question because I didn't print that out. But so there are three ways um, that we like to that we like to present. So first is that you start a you can start a cybersecurity class. Now this is a good option for anybody who has a good chunk of time to dedicate to to cybersecurity. Um, so if you're in elementary schools, that looks like perhaps replacing a special. So your tech special, your media special or something along those lines. Um, and if you're in the high school space, that could look like having a full class or even in that intro to computer science to have a section or unit of cybersecurity. Now, you could either build your curriculum from the standards or the competencies that we saw on the last slide, or you can use existing curriculum. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> or you could use existing curriculum, such as cyber.org's free curriculum. More on that later. The second on that list is 
for those people who don't have quite as much time to dedicate to an entire class or a special, um, perhaps you just have just a little bit of time to weave it into your existing core curriculum. You can use the standards or the competencies that we previously mentioned uh, to weave cybersecurity where you believe it makes sense in your existing core curriculum. So if you're having your students um, for the first time use the computer to type a paper, that would be an excellent opportunity to talk about cybersecurity <laughs> and why you need to make sure that um, you're saving it properly and how vulnerable your data is and making sure that they log in properly and log out properly, all of those great things. There are several instances in which you can um, weave these standards in, but you could also look at the curriculum that's that's available, um, which are, you know, depending on what you use in cyber.org, uh, again, is a great resource. You could use a lesson within their curriculum and say like, wow, this would really um go well in week, you know, 13 of the year. And the last option. So for those of you that, that either don't have time at all, or you have so much interest from the student body in going further that you can't fit it into a school day, you have the option of a cybersecurity after school program. Uh, which I love, by the way. Starting a cybersecurity after school program could be the way to go. And you could, oh, hold on, back. You could use curriculum uh, from an organization like cyber.org, but there are also other organizations that have after school challenges that you could also layer in to um, that curriculum. So I know that there is a um, Cyber Patriots Challenge and a Girls Who Code Club Challenge that you could also weave in and make a really, really cool uh, program that leads them to competing against other uh, other students and other schools while they're at it. So yeah, that's how we can start. Now, I want to turn it over because I know I've been mentioning cyber.org's uh, curriculum and all of their amazing resources, and I don't want to stand in the way anymore. So I am going to turn it over to Dr. Gardner. Uh, please take it away. Thanks, Julia. Um, really great information there. Um, I hope to be able to reference uh, the, the two House bill uh, sections that you talked about, but certainly uh, some of these bullets here uh, to get started with cybersecurity in the classroom. So if you can advance uh, and go ahead and skip to the next one there. Um, so uh, cyber.org, as I, as I handed to you uh, at the beginning, is funded through a grant from uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, out of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and with that opportunity, we have a, a team of, of recovering educators, as we call ourselves, who are uh, focused on the curriculum development mission uh, of cyber.org. And, and their, their goal is to write curriculum for elementary, middle, and high school. And then through the funding of the grant, we give it away at no cost. So all of our curriculum uh, can be used in any K-12 classroom across the country at no cost. We have free access to professional development, including virtual and face-to-face -face resources. Uh, and in many cases, a lot of technology that comes at no cost as well. Uh, so we'll talk through a lot of that today, but also we'll, we'll spend some time on the standards as well. Uh, so three bullets here just kind of uh, identifying our, our outreach and our, our, our the work that we do uh, in the elementary, middle, and high school space for teachers uh, and, and their students. So we can go ahead and advance, and we'll start talking about some of the curriculum. So in our cybersecurity space, uh, we have two soon-to-be three courses here. Um, on the left, we have cybersecurity, which we consider to be our, our technical advanced high school cybersecurity course. This is a course that's going to be uh, taught to students who have a goal of cybersecurity in their future, whether it be uh, advanced studies in, in higher ed or they're going to uh, sit for certifications and enter the workforce. But that cybersecurity course is based on the CompTIA Security Plus credential. It gives students hands-on access to malware and, and, and cyber attacks in a safe, virtualized cyber range environment. And it talks through a lot of the theory and, and the examples that we've seen of cybersecurity throughout history. Uh, so it's more than just 
um, Security Plus. There's a lot of great um, law related, current events related content that students are going to uh, experience through that course. Uh, there's a lot of content there. There's a lot of topics in the Security Plus exam, and we wanted to make sure that everything was covered. So there's upwards of 130, 140 individual lessons, but they're really, a, a lot of them are very small bites designed to be taught, you know, two, three at a time in a class, and then a lab to support the discussion that's happening. Uh, we've got syllabus uh, samples available. We've got pacing guides and suggested order documents available with this course to help teachers who may not know Security Plus or this technical cybersecurity landscape, kind of give them some support um, to present that content, or at least to, to whittle it down into something that they can present in their classroom. Cybersecurity basics is what is, is content that we're writing from scratch based on our K-12 cybersecurity learning standards. This is content that's primarily at this point aimed for elementary and middle school classrooms, and it's small activity-based content as opposed to a whole year long course. Um, so as, as Julia mentioned, right, if you're looking to embed cybersecurity into a current class, the learning standards are the way to do that. And Cybersecurity Basics gives you an opportunity to take a look at some lessons that have been written that you can incorporate into, into content that you're teaching in your classroom already in the elementary and middle school space. Um, we've got content that's written around digital citizenship, uh, kind of what it means to be a cyber citizen. Uh, we've got some security content where we talk about passwords and things that are developmentally appropriate for elementary and middle school students. Uh, it's scripted for teachers who are new to cybersecurity. Um, there's opportunities to kind of say this and, and wait for this response and feed students with this kind of thought prompt. Uh, so we want to make sure that any teacher can embrace this content and bring it into their classroom. Um, so the third course we're adding, uh, it's going to come online sometime uh, around or, or shortly after January 1, uh, is going to fall between these two, and we're going to call it Intro to Cybersecurity. And that's going to be an eighth, ninth grade course uh, that's written with some technical content, some non-technical content, but it's really going to be for every student as opposed to that cybersecurity course, which is for those who are pursuing a future in cybersecurity. We wanna make sure to hit that um, computer science coursework, right? That any high school student has an opportunity to study some kind of computer science or cybersecurity. Um, that intro to cybersecurity is gonna give you that option. That advanced cybersecurity based on Security Plus, um, that's for a, a specific audience, not necessarily the entire population. And then cybersecurity basics is that computer literacy skills uh, portion of the house bill uh, that all students, again, developmentally appropriate, have access to computer literacy skills, in this case, the cybersecurity piece of um, computer literacy. Uh, we can advance and we'll talk about some of the other content that you're going to have access to uh, after you register for access to the content. On the next slide, we'll see. Um, so these are our kind of technology courses. These are um, not necessarily um, high skill required, but there's a, a technology piece that's required. Uh, there's no textbooks, right? The content's all available online. It's downloadable PDFs. So there's no textbook purchases that have to happen. But in some cases, there are technology packages that you'll need. For example, robotics in the classroom uh, and cyber literacy are two courses where we're using uh, a Bobot or a Arduino, a Shieldbot with Arduino or a Cyberbot from Parallax, which is a company out in Rockland, California, uh, that provides these, these little, um, about the size of, um, you know, a loaf of bread you might get at uh, Outback, right? It's it's not a full loaf, it's, it's like a half loaf. Uh, and it's a robotics platform that's programmable through text-based programming, uh, which is where we get our connection to cybersecurity, because if I'm going to do cybersecurity, chances are you're going to need to do Linux, which is all text-based. Uh, so we're doing text-based programming with these robotics platforms. Um, we're, we're not making uh, a large use of things like Lego uh, or, or other drag and drops, although we have drag and drop opportunities in that course called Coding Fundamentals, where we're working with Microbit. But our drag and drop is, is merely a stepping stone into those text-based opportunities. We want to make sure that students, as early as possible, are getting um, exposure to text-based programming languages, whether it's BASIC or Python or, or C with Arduino. Uh, so robotics in the classroom and cyber literacy, two platforms that um, have that kind of robotics need in the classroom. And we're, we're seeing applications of two or three students per bot. Um, but we're not talking 
um, you know, VEX or, or Lego costs. We're still sub 300 per robotics package, around 260 bucks for those robotics packages. And like I said, they're out of Parallax, a partner of ours that you can find on our website. Coding fundamentals, uh, we're using Microbit. Uh, and we're doing some cybersecurity applications with both block-based and text-based through, through Python um, applications through Microbit. Uh, and again, you're getting access to all of this when you sign up for uh, content with cyber.org. Uh, take a look at Coding Fundamentals. Uh, what I like about that course is there are parallel activities in each of those, like I said, block-based and text-based pathways, uh, so that if you're teaching, say, a middle school uh, class on um, coding or computer science, and you have access to microbits, um, and you've got a group of students who maybe are progressing faster than the rest, you've got block-based activities in things like Hello World and animation and conditionals and buttons, but you've got the exact same activities in text-based for those who get it, right? Start with the block-based. When you get it, hand them the text-based lesson. It's the exact same objective. They're just going to see it through the lens of Python, Hello World, animation, coding uh, um, uh, buttons and conditionals and those kinds of things. So really great opportunities uh, to kind of differentiate in the in the same classroom. Uh, and then IT Fundamentals uh, is a course that's based on the, uh, the IT Fundamentals exam from CompTIA, uh, kind of a nice uh, entry level kind of survey style um, credential from CompTIA. Uh, and, and that course is designed to, to help students succeed uh, on that exam. Uh, on the next slide, we have our uh, kind of low, no tech uh, opportunities, and, and we have a lot of call outs to cyber and cybersecurity on the next slide. And we'll see things like cyber society and computational thinking and STEM EDA. Uh, and, and what we've got here are really, really good um, modular opportunities for every teacher and every student, even if you don't have a focus on cybersecurity, to bring a conversation on cyber into your classroom. Cyber society is kind of research-based opportunities to talk to students around cyber business, cyber law, cyber politics, cyber terrorism. Um, we have these um, investigations and analysis modules where students can play the role of a DHS investigator who have been assigned some case of an event happened somewhere in the world and they need to solve it. They have to identify the who, what, when, where, and why. Um, I hate to use the term fake news, but it is a simulation. Uh, it, these aren't real world events. They are real world like events. And the environment lives within the documents that come with that, uh, each module within cyber society. So students have access to the modules. They have access to the universe and they live within that universe while they research that, um, that event. So it's called ACES, Analysis and Investigation of Cyber Theme Scenarios. Uh, and it lives within cyber society. If you haven't seen it before, uh, give a look. We've got eight modules there and there's some really good role playing opportunities for students. Um, computational th thinking, we've taken a look at, at uh, Jeanette Wing's definition of computational thinking and broken it down into three curriculum areas for teachers. What does computational thinking look like for an elementary school math teacher, science teacher, or an ELA teacher? What does computational thinking look like for a middle school math teacher, science teacher, and an ELA teacher? Uh, and finally, a year-long high school opportunity to deep dive into nine weeks of computational thinking in math, computational thinking in science, and computational thinking in ELA, followed by a, a nine-week capstone uh, to round out kind of this, this year-long high school opportunity in computational thinking. Uh, the elementary and middle school stuff, kind of like cybersecurity basics, are short activity-based opportunities for teachers to see samples of lessons that are broken down into a, a computational thinking presentation. If I'm going to teach, you know, something with the scientific method, or uh, maybe I'm going to teach fractions in my middle school class, we've taken a fractions lesson and written it into a computational thinking um, uh, lesson plan style, so that maybe a teacher can see that and say, okay, I like that, but I'm going to apply, you know, three variable equations or I'm going to apply, uh, you know, division properties in, in elementary school uh, to a computational thinking platform. So um, we would love to for folks to take a look at those, um, provide us with feedback. If you write a lesson in a computational thinking 
um, lens that you think would be uh, great to share back with us. Um, we always want to uh, give you access to our network of 27,000 teachers, uh, and we love new content. Uh, science Plus is written around the phenomenological um, objectives, uh, the new new science standards uh, that include phenomenological um, learning. So uh, there's some really great content. That's elementary only, three through five right now. Um, we're working on tier one uh, approval here in Louisiana, and, and we'll provide more information on when that's available, uh, just to kind of speak to the relevance and the uh, validity of that content. And lastly, the last thing I'll talk about today, curriculum-wise, STEM EDA, uh, an a middle school opportunity roughly aligned to sixth, seventh, and eighth grades for students to explore um, the engineering design process and how it applies to things like egg drop, right? You've done egg drop. Uh, in, in many science classes, but an egg drop using the um, engineering design process with a with a, a, a creative component included in it uh, is an egg drop like you've never done before, right? It's not just an egg that has to be protected as it falls, but it's a vessel that's providing um, supplies to refugees uh, that are, you know, e experiencing some um, some crisis somewhere on the globe. Uh, so students are going to not only develop this vessel to protect the eggs that falls, but there's a storyline that they have to create and they have to think collaboratively and critically as a team uh, to develop the storyline and the vessel, and then they present them both. And, and it's just a really great uh, exploration into consistent themes that are already being taught in middle school science classes uh, with an engineering design process focus. All right, so um, next slide talks a little bit about uh, some of our opportunities to support you with professional development uh, webinars like this. We've got another uh, workshop coming up in a couple of weeks uh, through this network where we're going to talk more about the standards. Uh, we're hosting stuff all the time at cyber.org slash events. Um, we had a, a workshop last night that dealt with some malicious attacks using the cyber range. Uh, teachers who are interested in learning more about that technical cybersecurity uh, can join with our content authors, like I said, recovering educators for 90 minutes and work through labs, experience the range as if they're students, they can ask questions of the of the presenters, present maybe issues that they've had in the classroom. Um, I, I, I don't say this lightly, our professional development is second to none. Uh, really great opportunities, engaging opportunities uh, for teachers who are new to the content to come and learn from not only the authors of the content, but the network of teachers who are already presenting it. Um, I, I love the network that forms around Around these events. Uh, we have what I refer to as roadies, right? Folks who come to event after event because they want to practice it again and again and kind of see how things have changed. But they're also there to support the new teachers to this content. So uh, definitely take a look at cyber.org slash events for upcoming professional development. And we'll um, move on. I think we're going to talk about standards. Uh, oh, oh, last thing uh, before standards, um, we're doing some outreach for students and their career awareness of opportunities in cybersecurity. There are currently more than 700,000 cybersecurity jobs available across the country, uh, and it's our goal to identify this K-12 student population as that future cyber workforce. Uh, so we need to let them know what kind of jobs are available, what they look like, what they pay, what kind of degrees or certifications, if any, do they need, what soft skills and, and job skills they're going to be required uh, to, to provide to those employers. Uh, and as a result, we've got 24 career profile cards that are all mapped to the nice NIST cybersecurity workforce framework, um, where we're going to give students an idea in a nice, colorful, um, inviting representation uh, of, of uh, employability opportunities in the field of cyber. Here's an example of a system testing and evaluation specialist. You don't necessarily need a degree. There are certifications that would be beneficial. Salaries of around $47,000 with potential for job growth, some soft skills, common job duties, uh, and some of these um, resources if you if you go online to cyber.org and take a look at those career profiles there are additional um, opportunities to engage with uh, professionals in the field we've recorded some interviews with people in these roles that then can talk to students and share information about what they're doing in the field how they got there those kinds of things so the career awareness um, career profile cards are a fantastic opportunity. We've got some uh, physical copies of those in like a, a baseball trading card size that we're happy to share with teachers in the classroom. Next up, um, we've already talked a lot about this data, 27,000 teachers, a couple million students have been impacted. We'll go to the next slide. Um, Illinois, our current impact, this was as of March 2022. 
Um, at that time, we had roughly 553 teachers enrolled with access to the curriculum, impacted uh, 197 some odd students uh, through camps and, and, and competitions and, and the camp opportunities. I said that already, um, a number of events that we've hosted, teachers trained technology in the classroom, totaling more than $43,000. Uh, and on cyberseek.org, as of March, there were 20,000 jobs in cyber available across the state. Uh, some of the partners in the top right who we've been working with, uh, we definitely need to update that, uh, Georgette, if you're listening to include um, CS for Success. So um, next slide, please. Uh, multiplier effect. This is a, a kind of a, a, a just a, a general study we did in Northeast Louisiana, um, Northeast Louisiana with Louisiana Tech University, Grambling State, and Bossier Parish Community Colleges. We took a look at the incoming freshman class, what high school they came from, and did that high school have access to Cyber.org curriculum or not? And we see a roughly four x. Um, multiplier of students going into cyber programs at those three institutions uh, if they came from a school that had access to cyber that are curriculum. Uh, so it's it's not verifiable, right? It's not a, a deep longitudinal study. It's just an informal survey of where they came from and did that school have access. Um, but we like to tout it a little bit. So uh, if you uh, have access to cyber.org content, um, let's see what schools you're sending students to. Uh, we'd love to, to, to know, you know, how um, how tech, what kind of technical programs uh, they're headed into. All right, standards. Uh, as Julia mentioned, um, back in 2020, excuse me, 2021, uh, we worked with 30 educators from across the country. Um, 26, 27 different states were represented. Um, we had three writing sessions and uh, these, these awesome group of individuals put their minds together and developed this set of what we have um, dubbed the, the K-12 cybersecurity learning standards. Um, I don't see a lot of last names in this list of participants today, so I don't know if anyone from the panel is, is in today's session or not. Uh, by all means, throw up a hand uh, if you are part of that group. Uh, but it was a really excellent opportunity to take a look at elementary, middle, and high school um, learning standards that could be universally applied with little, little needed access to technology, um, and that would welcome all students and all teachers to be able to have conversations in the classroom on cybersecurity. Next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about the breakdown of the standards. Uh, oh, uh, that was it, apparently. So um, the standards are broken into three categories. Um, we talk about, um, I'm trying to pull up my slide on my laptop and it's not there either. So um, we have computing systems, uh, digital citizenship and security, which includes um, physical security. Um, um, waiting for this page to open. Oh, there it is. Computing systems, digital citizenship, and security are the three categories, and within each of those categories are three subcategories. Uh, and I think security is most applicable, right? That's the most solid cybersecurity content. Again, technical, but it doesn't require technology necessarily in the classroom, where we're talking about information security, network security, and physical security. Uh, we got a lot of great digital citizenship content. Like I said, is then cybersecurity basics is being developed around those two topics and, and digital citizenship includes online safety and ethics and policy and legal issues. Um, it's important to talk to students, uh, again, developmentally appropriate, uh, about policy and, and laws that are in effect that are, you know, having some impact uh, oversight of their use of technology, um, you know, whether it's, you know, GDPR, if they're traveling overseas or FERPA or COPPA, right, if, if they're do, doing work here, um, it's important to understand that there is some legislative uh, practice that's happening to support their safe experience of, of online systems and then computing systems where we're talking about the devices and, and the technology that is providing access, including communication and networking, hardware and software. Um, scroll down and, and just land on a random page just to kind of talk through what um, a, a standard looks like. Um, go ahead, go ahead, pass that one. Um, let's, here we go. So and any, any, any slide here, so just Show me from top. So the way the standards are presented uh, at the top of the page, we've got, so here's the first standard in computing systems under the communication and networking subcategory uh, and under this, this the standard header for network communication. Uh, so we've got an example of a K2 standard. So this is a, a grade band, right? We, we took a look at, at content and language and verbiage that was developmentally appropriate for K2 
three, five, six, eight, and nine, twelve, and then created a, a scaffold style where the conversation starts in K two, but then it gets a little more rigorous in, in three, five, and so on for six, eight, and so on for nine, twelve. Um, so we're going to talk about what it means to be online in a K two audience. We're going to talk about the difference between being online uh, and then, as as Julia mentioned early on, right? If I unplug. Am I still online, right? I'm, I've got this local device now that's not necessarily connected to the network, uh, and an unplug, right, being being a term that references disconnecting from the network, whether it's wireless or wired. Uh, and then in three five, that conversation kind of matures a little bit, and we talk about the network communication that has to happen for those devices to talk to one another. And then in six eight, a network topologies, right? When we talk about how networks can be formed and, and laid out to provide to, to provide the most efficient method of communication opportunities. And then we're gonna differentiate between Mac and IP address. And that talks a little bit about, right? The device that I'm using and the information I'm giving away through you know, the, the name that I call it or the identifiers that it freely gives away because that's how it connects to a network, uh, followed by 912, where now we're going to break this down into OSI and we get from, right, the concept of being online uh, down to OSI model in one standard as we progress through those age bands. And each standard is similarly structured uh, in the K23568 and 912 age bands. There is clarification statements. There are you know, sample verbiage of, 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 of ways to formulate this in your classroom. And at the very end, there's a glossary uh, of terms that may be new to teachers. While we didn't identify what words are available in the glossary through the standards, um, the glossary here is, is fairly extensive. Uh, we went through it and hit most of the um, the vocabulary that you might be expected to to know on a computer science or cybersecurity um, you know exam on you know, project lead the way or something or another one of the providers who are who have access to, to content um, so it's a really good glossary that that I think students should have access to this is available physically uh, or digitally um, you can download it on the cyber.org slash standards website uh, we also have copies that we can send out if you're interested uh, if you're a more tactile learner um, we're happy to share that as well uh, if we get back to the slideshow I think we're ready to talk about resources um, from a cyber.org perspective got to have access to the content and it's free uh, so there's no reason excuse me you shouldn't have access cyber.org slash form slash curricula sign up rather than typing that in go to cyber.org there's a button at the top right that says sign up uh cybersecurity learning standards there's cyber.org slash standards um professional development there's cyber.org slash events and and the one thing i kind of hinted at uh which is going live um coast to coast january 1 uh, is our free to access cyber.org range. This is a virtual environment that's gonna provide every student in the country access to a Kali Linux and a vulnerable, what we call a vulnerable Windows 7 machine that are networked uh, so that we can safely practice malicious attacks like uh, credential harvesting or ransomware or um, password analysis. And we can look at that uh, in, in this safe virtual environment uh, using Windows as the victim's machine and Kali as the offensive uh, cyber attacker's machine. Uh, and we're giving access to teachers right now in pilot mode, January 1, live coast to coast. So cyber, apps.cyber.org slash apply. You can go there now and uh, get signed up for this release January 1. I think that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We also mentioned um, a couple of other resources that I did not put up here that I should have, um, mainly the House Bill, uh, House Bill 2170. So we'll be sure to, to send that out in an email later, as well as the link to the ISBE's Computer Literacy Competencies and ISBE's computer science standards. Uh, those will round out some of the resources that we'll, we'll send out to you all. But yeah, so let's see, next steps. So um, Dr. Gardner had also mentioned that there is a lot of professional development that cyber.org puts on. We wanted to let you know that there is also a workshop that is going to dive into these K-12 uh, cyber cybersecurity standards and uh, allow you to, to tinker around in there and, and see what you enjoy doing and what you could potentially bring back to your classroom. That will be on December 8th, so I believe that's next Thursday, 
from 3.30 to 6.30 Central Time. And the registration link is on the screen. I'll mention, have- um, I'll mention real quick, if you want to participate in that, please make sure you've registered for access to curriculum. Um, today, tomorrow, it takes usually a day uh, or two to get access because I do want to open up some of those lessons from Cybersecurity Basics and talk through what they how they might be implemented in your classroom. Cool. We also had, um, we recently wrote a blog on understanding the national K-12 cybersecurity standards as well. And that is over on LinkedIn, if I recall right. And the bit.ly is on the screen as well. I want to make sure that you all have an opportunity to, to uh, click on those so that you can have those that information. But I do believe we're also sending out the slides, so you'll have access to it later. Um, Let's see. Ah, yes. So here is our contact information, our social media information, as well as our websites um, so that you have access to them. And you could reach out to us if you have any questions or if you need any of the resources that we mentioned today.